The minister who prayed constantly like a monk. Once I said to him, why didn't you go into a monastery? He replied, the bishop wouldn't let me. He told me I would be more useful in the world than in a monastery. He advocated reconciliation between the two age-old enemies, that is to say, France and Germany. Schumann never had a career plan. He didn't know the expression. It didn't exist at the time. He did his duty as a Christian, answering a call. Robert Schumann was a prophet above all else someone who dared to believe in something unimaginable, someone who dared to hope beyond all hope. Robert Schumann was born to a mother from Luxembourg and a father from Lorraine, France, in 1886 in Clausen, Luxembourg, at the foot of the plateau where today's European institutions are situated. When he was little, he used to go on holiday to Evrange, where his uncle's land straddled the border between France and Luxembourg, with the border markers cutting a field into two. So that when they were ploughing, the plough would pass from France into Luxembourg and from Luxembourg into France. And so the idea of going further, beyond borders, came to him very early on. He lost his father when he was quite young, so his upbringing was greatly influenced by his mother, who gave him a deep faith, taught him the piano, taught him a whole lot of other things. He attended secondary school in Luxembourg before going on to study in Metz, Munich, Berlin and Strasbourg, which was part of Germany at the time. One day, his mother went to a wedding, and at the time she was travelling by carriage with some friends, when the horse bolted and she fell out and was killed. For Robert Schumann, this was a terrible shock, so much so that people thought he would leave his chosen career behind and enter a monastery. Schumann was 25 years old at the time. One of his friends, Henri Hirschbach, wrote to him several days after the event. Everything is not and should not be over for you on this earth. Your duty, difficult but at the same time light, forbids you to let yourself to be completely absorbed by this grief. You must remain a layperson, because that way you will be more successful in doing good, which is your only preoccupation. It's my opinion that the saints of the future will be saints in suits. In 1914, Robert Schumann was discharged from military service because of a weak constitution. When peace returned, Alsace-Lorraine became French again. Until then, a German-speaking Luxembourger, he took the French nationality of his father. There was a lot of pressure on him to become Member of Parliament for the Moselle region. After much hesitation, he accepted and was elected on November 16, 1919 at the age of 33. He lived in this house, which was found for him by my family. Schumann lived here from 1926 until his death in 1963. He was an exceptional man, very modest, gentle, but not soft. Because in the Beatitudes we are told, blessed are the gentle, not blessed are the soft. And it took a lot of courage to launch the European Union in 1950. Robert Schumann had a very profound and intense spiritual life. It was always nourished since his early childhood by his Christian faith, by his commitments in the social Catholicism movement, and by prayer, as well as by reading, by meditation. Schumann used to go to Mass nearly every day. There was a church in a convent right opposite his house, so he only had to cross the road to go several times a day to pray in this chapel where he had his own regular place.
Lord Jesus, as we are called to receive the gift of your body in the Eucharist, we wish to serve our brothers and give glory to the Father by the prayer of our lips, the words of our mouth, and the work of our hands. He prayed a lot. I would say to my pupils, you'd better behave because Mr. Schumann is coming. He always went to the back, to the last bench. He was really a man of prayer. We had a lot of Mirabel plums, and when I brought him some, his housekeeper said to me, Mr. Schumann would like to see you. He asked me if I worked hard at school, and then he gave me some sweets, quite unusual at the time. He worked in Miss and came home on the bus each evening with other people. He liked being with people very much. Now we can understand better why he began to get Europe underway. On May 10, 1940, Robert Schumann learned early in the morning that German troops had marched into Belgium and the Netherlands. Next, it was France's turn to be invaded. He was arrested by the Germans who would have liked his collaboration, but he was obviously completely hostile to the way in which Hitler viewed the world. During the Second World War, Robert Schumann was arrested. After his arrest, he was brought here to Neustadt. He wasn't kept in a normal prison. It was more like being under surveillance. He had great freedom of movement, which he used to go to Mass in our house on Sundays. He managed to escape. He hid in several different places, but mainly in a monastery. He studied some theology. And when he returned after the war, he didn't have the burden of being thought of as someone who had had weaknesses with regard to Germany. He had none. But he wanted peace, which is quite another thing. When Schumann arrived at the foreign ministry, it was just the moment when people in France were realizing that it was not possible to continue with a policy based on discrimination, that we had to offer a hand to Germany, that we should help it to enter Europe, and that we had to cooperate with Germany and with other European countries in a wider context. He had to face insurrection and riots when the Soviet Union wanted to tilt Western Europe into its orbit. He was violently attacked by the communists, who were very numerous in the National Assembly at the time, and he held firm. They asked him how he had managed to stand up to such violent and often physically aggressive attacks. At one point, the stewards had had to separate people who wanted to attack him. He replied, Throughout this period, I had my hand in my pocket and I was holding my rosary. He really drew strength from his intimate relationship with the Lord. Reconciliation between France and Germany in 1950 was not at all obvious. Many people talked about reconciliation, but they could not push the idea through until Schumann, as foreign minister, tried to make it reality. It was Jean Monnet who set out the plan ultimately announced on the 9th of May 1950. And this plan immediately attracted Schumann. Still, he was taking risks with his career, and he did this because he had the courage 
And this courage meant not thinking first and foremost about his political ambitions, his own career, but saying to himself, this is what I must do, and I will do it no matter what happens. He came here to Chazelle beforehand, on the first weekend of May. He looked at it very carefully, and then he saw that he must push ahead. Germany sees the logic for the community more than anyone else. It could play its part fully within a united Europe. When he came back to Paris on the Monday morning, he said, warn Jean Monnet, we're going ahead, and then we were off. They kept things secret for eight days before the famous speech of the 9th of May 1950, because Schumann was careful not to reveal his plan, which might have been demolished straight away. He got it through the cabinet meeting very cleverly, under other business, you know, at 5 to 12, when everyone wanted to go to lunch. That's how he got the speech through the cabinet meeting straight away. When the Prime Minister, Georges Bidot, was hesitating, an usher came in and brought a letter from Adenauer, which said, we fully support Mr. Schumann's plan. So Bidot said, OK, go ahead. And this is how the speech came to be made on the 9th of May, 1950. In championing the cause of a united Europe for more than 20 years, France's main objective has always been to promote peace. A united Europe has not been created. We have had war. Europe will not be made all at once, or according to one single plan. Rather, it will be formed by taking concrete measures which bring about real solidarity. That is why, continued Mr. Schumann, the French government is offering to take immediate action on a limited yet decisive point. It is proposing to place the entire Franco-German production of coal and steel under a joint high authority in an open organization with the participation of other countries. The war had come to an end five years earlier. The hatred and desire to take revenge for the horrors of Nazism was still strong. But Schumann followed his deepest intuition, and he took the bold step of launching this project. The German, Italian, Belgian, Dutch and Luxembourg governments immediately responded to the French call. In six capitals, a major political plan took shape, that of creating unity in Europe by peaceful means. He was aware that he was responsible for a mission. He was a gentle, simple and humble man. But when he had a revelation of what was right and what had to be done, he gave himself over entirely to providence and resolutely moved forward. He would let nothing get in his way. On February 10, 1953, the first European coal train, followed three months later by the first steel train, crossed the now obsolete frontiers without hindrance. The common market of coal and steel had become a reality. Let's take another look at the little book that he wrote at the end of his life. The final chapter is called Serving Humanity. In this chapter, Schumann is talking especially about peace. He explains how he understands peace. In his view, peace is not only the absence of war, it is not an abstract idea, it is not a sentimental idea. In fact, peace is a daily building process and the building is founded on cooperation, solidarity, liberty and fraternity. 
Schumann's view was therefore that peace had to be founded on Christian values, which since then have become the values of Western humanism. Europe is finding its feet. It knows that it holds its own future in its hands. It has never been so close to its goal. May God not allow this opportunity, its final chance for salvation, to pass by. What I find very interesting is the consistency between Schumann's political action and his personal outlook. From 1955 to 1956, he was already in favour of expanding the community eastwards. It may seem very surprising that a Hungarian should be interested in Robert Schumann. But during my studies, when I was doing historical research, I came across a phrase which talked about a minister who prayed all the time, like a monk. I was really moved by this minister who prayed and who was compared to a monk. In fact, I was totally amazed. What particularly moved me was how this man had dedicated his life. He had dared to hope, dared to look beyond the existing European political reality in the 1940s and 1950s. For Hungarians, 1956 was a very interesting year because of the Hungarian insurrection. As you know, at this time the Hungarian insurgents were rebelling against the communist regime. He was extremely moved by this event and once again he was looking further ahead. In his opinion, even then, it had to be said that Europe must not be limited to six countries. Further steps needed to be taken, Europe had to be expanded. I could find no connection between the faith of those men whom we call the founding fathers of Europe and the Europe that we know today. It was actually a matter of luck that I came to read and become interested in Robert Schumann's declaration of the 9th of May 1950. World peace cannot be maintained without creative initiatives that can deal with the dangers jeopardizing peace. I was really moved when I read this text. I felt a bit like a spoilt child. I suddenly realized that the fact that it was now possible for me to go to Germany, to feel well there, to have friends there, was down to these men who, at that time, had dared to believe that peace between France and Germany was possible. After the Second World War, we were not necessarily at peace. The world was split between East and West, and this separation went right through the middle of Germany, through the middle of Berlin, and in 1961 a wall was built through my own city. Robert Schumann was, in my opinion, one of the great visionaries of the last century, one of the most important politicians of his time. When Europe was still in ruins and there was still a lot of hatred, he had this idea that Europe should unite in order to prevent it from ever again engaging in anything like two world wars in one century. This idea of a united Europe was instrumental in bringing the wall down. Currently, 28 countries belong to the European Union, not only Western Europe, but also Eastern Europe, from the north to the south. We owe this to Robert Schumann and his vision of a united Europe.
As a Catholic myself, I know that such ideas never come to fruition without a spiritual foundation. I grew up initially in France, then in Belgium, and currently I live in Germany. I believe that I'm extremely fortunate as a young person to have lived in these three countries. And I owe this good fortune to some extent to Robert Schumann, who had the fabulous idea of creating Europe. As a European, I believe it's important to vote and get involved in the European Union. I don't know how yet, but I hope to get involved in preserving the peace that currently exists between our different countries. The fact that we have currently had such a long period of peace in Europe is not something that happened by itself. Many people believe that it will last forever, but we can see that the world is not free from war. There are a number of conflicts among Europe's neighbours, such as in Ukraine. I hope that young people can recognise that this idea of European unity is their future, and my hope is that young people take good care of it, that they continue to strive for peace, and that the future continues to bring peace and well-being to all. We are talking to you from Bilavoda, a small village in the Czech Republic on the border with Poland. A poignant feature of the local cemetery is that it is the last resting place of 700 nuns who had to spend their lives here against their wishes. The elimination of 32 religious orders and the closure of 502 convents was one of the consequences of the 1948 communist putsch. Currently, young people from different countries of Europe come here under the leadership of the Schemenneuf community to revitalize themselves and to build new bridges between nations. In my opinion, the European Union represents unity, which is a very difficult thing to achieve, but which can be very attractive. What it means is a unity by which we respect our mutual frontiers and remain open to those on the other side. A fraternal Europe where we do not fight one another, but rather we cooperate with each other and even join forces to provide aid to the rest of the world. For me, the European Union is about cooperation and fraternity between countries, and the feeling of security provided by the European Union is also very important now. I should like to play an active part in the construction of Europe, of the European Union, myself. In my opinion, it is important for young people of my age to become aware of the real meaning of the European Union and to be encouraged to think about this project. It was the European Union that made it possible for me to take part in the Erasmus programme and it was a wonderful experience going to France and discovering everyday life there, getting to know oneself better through interacting with others, understanding what is really important for others. I believe that the fact that we are all different is of key importance, because these differences help to make us more broad-minded and help to unite us. I believe that Pope Francis has a crucial message for us when he says that we must get closer to one another and bear witness to the simplicity of the faith and of the closeness and mercy of God. Today, Europe no longer seems to recognize this and has forgotten its historical and spiritual roots. Duchovní. 
Robert Schuman, a former Prime Minister and Member of Parliament for the Moselle region, from 1919 to 1962 has died. The presence of five former heads of state in the very long procession which accompanied him in Metz on his final journey, along with many French and foreign delegations, has emphasized the great personality of the deceased from Lorraine, born in Luxembourg, worked tirelessly. In 1958, Robert Schumann received the Charlemagne Prize in Aix-la-Chapelle, a well-deserved reward for the work to which he had dedicated his life. This simple man, who was in fact a great European, a true father of Europe, has left us. Dear Mr. President, we are eight young people from six countries who attended your conference at the Sorbonne on Thursday, 12th of December 1953. We should like to thank you for the way in which you are struggling for our future, striving for peace and unity between nations. Your vision, which goes beyond party politics or even the interests of one country in particular, has been a source of inspiration for us. The word for this month is from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 15, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. This month, let us pray that Robert Schumann's vision for unity and reconciliation may continue to inspire the countries of Europe and also all other nations in order to build a world at peace. Let us pray that more and more Christians will hear this call to involve themselves in the field of politics, putting into practice the value.